The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I primarily focus on the invertebrates, little small critters. You might think of some alien creatures, pretty much right on the head. You are listening to Red River Radio. Stay tuned. Bird Calls is coming up in just a few moments right here on your public radio station. You want to make sure the flashlight stays as smooth as possible as you travel across the sea. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Have you ever really looked at a creek, stream, or river? I mean, really looked up close, down at the bottom. This guy does that for a living. Meet Dr. Arches Grubb, an aquatic invertebrate biologist. Invertebrates are really great indicators of water quality because the water quality is going down. Those are the first ones to disappear from the water. His name is Dr. Grubb, and this bug dude studies the health of Texas rivers by checking in on the tiny invertebrates that live here. Beautiful. I don't have a bottle, let me see if I can catch him for you. <laughs> There's a damselfly larva, oh, it's super small. Oh, this one's a caddisfly, green one. <laughs> I primarily focus on the invertebrates, little small critters. You get the black and yellow on it, love it. Just beautiful creatures underwater. You might think of some alien creatures, pretty much right on the head. This is the Blanco River, and it's Dr. Grubb's latest study site. It's very important because I'm studying and finding out what all the diversity of these invertebrates are. And so I am capturing a snapshot here and recording what all we find. I'm only getting 0.98 CFS. We are measuring water quality now which includes temperature, conductivity, which is the salinity of the water, um, how much oxygen's in the water. I really like this site. It just has a lot of different components to it. So it's got big pools where a lot of the water's flowing up and the water's deeper. Then it's got riffles that are shallow with a lot of cobble and a lot of stones. Bugs like a lot of things to hold on to, so a lot of debris and vegetation. Um, they really love that kind of stuff. So this is just a great site for that. There we go. You're gonna find tons of these bugs. Most of them are uh, the nymph stage or the larval stage. See those case builders right here? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of them here. Oh, wow, look at this. There's a stone fly. Yes. Ooh. Look at that. That's the biggest hellgrimite for today. Oh my gosh. You see it? Very cool. These two are here because of the floods of 2015. Good evening from Central Texas, the scene of utter devastation, a natural disaster of epic proportions. These flood levels were really huge. Uh, it was a 500 year flood event. Regular discharge on the Blanco River is about 90 CFS, which is cubic feet per second and it peaked around 150,000 CFS. Um, it came out of its banks, all the vegetation, took down giant 100-year cypress trees. 
lot of debris came through the system and scrubbed the substrate clean. The floods wiped out almost 90% of the aquatic invertebrates. Ooh, yeah. So for the next several months, these two will check six different sites along the Blanco River. We collect three samples, just dump all whatever we have. There's gonna be tons of insects packed in it. So now that flows are back down to where they're normal level, uh, we wanna see how the bug population is reestablishing itself. Which ones were most affected and uh, how they're doing now. While the invertebrates make their way back to the lab, Dr. Grubb gets a break at the house. Hey, Bucky, how y'all doing? Sort of. This is Tibbles. He's Pearl's rat. It's a bit hectic on the home front. I really like the bears because they have like a really beautiful color. He has a little heart on his back, if you can see. I haven't named this tiger barb yet. And then he runs, he runs over here. <laughs> it's kind of like the wild kingdom here, with plenty of fish. This is a 250 gallon tank. These are some Roseline sharks. These are from India. Uh, then we got some uh, clown loaches over here. These are from Indonesia. My husband lives, breathes, dreams, fish. Yeah, this is my planted aquarium. It's a 65 gallon tank. I got the whole thing set up natural with live plants. When we got married and lived together is when I noticed he was starting to do all these setups in our little itty bitty apartment. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that it'd last, and eventually the little 10 gallons were, would evolve to eight footers, and I'm just like, okay, this is a little extreme. <laughs> they say never take your work home with you. So I really like the blue in this Cardinal Tetris light up really nicely. But for arches, it seems like the opposite is true. Yeah, I mean, you gotta do what you love, right? So it's good. See how it goes. Really enjoying this every day when I come home from work. I just sit here, chill out, take a break instead of turning on the TV. I just enjoy watching this. This is one of the hardest parts. So these are some of the bugs we just collected from the Blanco River. This part typically takes quite a lot of time because uh, you have to look through the bugs, different parts of their bodies, uh, legs, the claws, the mouth parts, to figure out which one they are and go through the ski, which shows you what you're looking at. This is a case builder. So these guys, they build their cases with twigs and sand particles. As they get larger, they abandon the old shell and build another case. Yeah, look at that, dude. He's attacking my forceps. <laughs> the Helgramites, you'll find them only in clean water systems. They're an indicator of good water quality. Now I'm here on the microscope spending hours, days, and finally enter all the data, and after that, upload it on the computer, and that's where the fun begins. Like, you know, that's the stuff I really enjoy. It took well over a year to sample and analyze the aquatic invertebrates of the Blanco. All of this information from all these species goes into one dot. So you take all these samples, so all these dots run different matrices. Then math magic happens, and what looks like flying shapes is some serious science. And uh, finally you condense all the data, and this is what you get, the product. You know, we are able to see the trends. Arch's data showed that indeed, for several weeks after the flood, aquatic invertebrate numbers were way down. Yeah, the numbers were like almost nil. But his data crunching revealed that as time went by, the aquatic invertebrates returned. The numbers come back and stabilize at a certain level at each of those sites. The whole habitat is destroyed. The flood just takes off 90% of their population and still they're able to come back and just go to stable conditions like it was before. That's just amazing. Oh, look at this. For arches. That's the damsel play. Now he gets a chance to show off his life's passion to his kids. We go out to the river and we're swimming and all. 
Yeah, look at that. Right now, when they're flipping those rocks, they're seeing these creatures come out live. It's just amazing. <laughs> oh, that's a megaloptera. Guys, look, look. Actually out experiencing it. He's awesome. That's the 100% goal, is for them to be hands-on and touching. I mean, they are genuinely interested in buds. It's great. It's great. Man, I never knew why paintings could move. They're so cool. So whether it's taking the kids to see them up close. It's a riffle beetle. You see that black thingy moving? Or scoping them out in the lab. Look at that. Riffle beetle larva. Ooh, he just turned in. Nice. <laughs> It's easy to see Dr. Grubb's love for aquatic yep. invertebrates is pure. These organisms that we find in the water systems are really essential. We do not want sterile waters or polluted waters. That's not good for the fish, the bugs, or us humans. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to be able to leave these organisms in the river systems for my kids and their kids. We want to be able to leave the habitats in pristine conditions. Ooh, look at that. You know, not to be affected or impacted to the point where these critters are going to be knocked out of the system. So I want to do whatever I can to make a difference. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. about 100 miles one way for me to drive to the studio. I can't do it remotely. Easy peasy. You are listening to Red River Radio. Stay tuned. Bird Calls is coming up in just a few moments right here on your public radio station. I've never heard a show on the radio that people can call in and ask questions about birds. Cliff is currently the statewide non-game ornithologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, a position he has held since 1997, and he has been an avid bird watcher for more than 30 years. He is also the first author of the book, Hummingbirds of Texas, published. Every other month, Cliff Shackelford takes his love of birds across state lines to reach 10,000 listeners. Cliff, thanks for joining us again for Bird Calls tonight. Hey, Bill, happy to be here. And he starts with a bird to spotlight. This month is the Blue Jay. So we're going to talk about the Blue Jay for a minute. In the Red River Radio listening area, we have several species of songbirds that are predominantly blue, including the Eastern Bluebird, the Blue Grosbeak and then to go bunting, but the blue jay is the only one here with a crest. Blue jays are so popular, they even have a major league baseball team named after them. How about that? As soon as Cliff goes on the air, the phone calls start coming in, and they don't stop until the show ends. Gail from Marshall, you're online with Cliff. What's your question? Well, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm seeing an indigo bunting. It's the general public calling. It's, they're not bird watchers per se. They're just regular folks that see interesting things and they're curious about what these birds are they're seeing or behaviors. Let's listen to some that are mobbing. So you can see how that pitch has gone up and almost the intensity has gone yeah. up. These it's, are birds it's... that are mobbing a predator and they'll do this. It's like a neighborhood watch program. Give us a call right now. Bird Calls airs live in most of East Texas and Louisiana and parts of Mississippi and Arkansas. The show took flight after Cliff volunteered to help with the annual fund drive. He does this for us voluntarily, and I know it's a lot of work for him, and it, you know, it's travel back and forth. I love it. It's a one-hour show, and it goes by like a blink of an eye. It's so fast and furious and when one hour is done I'm like oh it feels like we just started I want to keep going. On the Eurasian collar dove we talked about a minute ago mm -hmm. he he really sounds like an owl. A lot of the doves do but this one really does and it's just an incessant woo hoo hoo woo hoo 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 And if you hear that outside in the day, and you think, what is that owl? And it won't stop. It's just this big, giant Eurasian collar dove. He's a gem of a guy. He's as Here we go. friendly All and left. approachable in person as he sounds like he is over the air. Oh my God, look at that. Cliff loves birds. Look at that. Oh. He does love birds, yeah. 
I've loved birds since I was a kid, about nine years old. And it, my parents thought it was a phase, like picking up frogs and bringing them home. Kids outgrow that, but I never outgrew looking at birds. I just love them. I just think there's there's so much interesting stuff going on with birds. Oh, look at that, flying in, boom. A lot of people that like watching reality TV ought to turn off the TV and go outside. It looks like it's gonna fall over at times. It's kind of fun to watch. Because birds, there's a reality there that's so pure, so real, and so interesting. Um, and that's really why I like birds. You are listening to Bird Calls from Red River Radio with our resident ornithologist, Cliff Shackelford. He is with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and he's been there for 30 years. And you can give us a call My co-producer right is Bill Beckett. Five, yeah, let me correct five, something. You said I've been with the department for 30 years, so, oh, yeah. Uh, 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 sorry, you've been an avid bird watcher for yeah. 13, 30 years. Yeah, I should. <laughs> I, I wish I was 30 years, because I could uh, no, turn in, turn in my over. papers. <laughs> here, here are my papers, I'm done. But no, I'm 19 years with the department, going strong. So he's working this, this big motherboard, and I just sit there and answer questions. And we have lines open right now. We are going to go to Claire from Shreveport. Claire, you're on line with Cliff. What's your question? Hi, Cliff. Such a big fan. So glad to oh. talk to you. Hey, great. Thanks, Claire. What's up? He's playing sounds that we've pre-recorded that we play on the air. Let's listen for a minute. <laughs> this is a begging northern mockingbird. And, and you'll notice these uh, in the springtime. They're, they're speckle-breasted. So mom and dad have no speckles at all on the chest. But, but a young bird fresh out of the nest has spots on the chest. But otherwise, he looks like a mockingbird. The tail's really stubby. Throughout bird calls, Cliff gives helpful tips, like how to make hummingbird food. Always four parts water, one part sugar, never any other kind of sweetener. A mistake a lot of people do is they put a feeder up and they say, I'm not gonna change it until they drink it all. And, and that's a mistake in the hot south. You wanna replace it every three or four days. So if that bothers you, just don't fill it up to the, to the brim, just fill it up halfway because it, it kind of spoils. It's like feeding your kids sour milk. Well, basically it turns into alcohol, doesn't it? Well, it may, it may be so, and that might, that might be appealing to some listeners, but it's not appealing to the hummingbirds, so. As well as yeah, practical no, advice. No, I don't think I'd stick my hand, though, on top of a monk parakeet. Boy, if they can crack a seed, uh -huh. just think what they could do your finger. <laughs> One more question before uh -huh. I'll let you go. Sure. It's a pretty good gig for Texas Parks and Wildlife, too. This is a great partnership for Parks and Wildlife because we don't have to spend a dime on the equipment. <laughs> they just send me over to preach the good word of birds through a radio station that's already established. The estimates with the radio show are reaching over 10,000 people. So I can reach a lot of people in one hour. Ben from Dry Prong, you're online with Cliff. What's your question? Uh, rain crows. Uh huh. I hear people say rain crow, and I don't know what the heck they're talking about. Okay, well, it's one of the few birds that sings during a rainstorm. And so, in a light, gentle rainstorm, they're still making their cow, 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 cow. And that's the elbow cuckoo. And that's also called the rain crow. And Cliff, we're going to close out this program with another conservation tip. What do you have for us this week? Yeah, on this month's conservation tip, we're going to discuss bird bass. And with more than 600 species of birds found in Texas, many in Louisiana too, there's plenty to talk about. The staff at the radio station think it's pretty cool that there's really that much interest in birds. And there really is. Thank you for calling Red River Radio. Would you like to make a pledge or are you calling with a bird Thank pledge? you. What I'd like to see happen is that this might get syndicated. That might have to wait. But now, Bird Calls airs monthly. This has been Bird Calls from Red River Radio. Our producers for this show are Bill Beckett and Cliff Shackelford. The audio for tonight's program will be posted to our website in the next few hours, and you can listen to this program again online at redriverradio.org. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. So you just completed your hunter education course and now you want to become a better shotgun shooter. I'm going to show you some everyday exercises to help you do that. The flashlight drill, 
the three bullet drill, and some mounting exercises. These were taught to me by Gil and Vicki Ash with OSP Shooting School. Let's get started. To do the flashlight drill, you need an unloaded shotgun and you need a small flashlight that is able to fit into the barrel. Indoors, in a room free of distraction, verify that your shotgun is unloaded and safe. Insert the small flashlight into the barrel of your shotgun. Start with the flashlight in the corner where the ceiling and the wall meet. Slowly mount your shotgun, continuing to move your flashlight across the seam. Okay, once you reach the other side, lower your shotgun and do that action again. In the opposite corner, from left to right, you want to make sure the flashlight stays as smooth as possible as you travel across the seam. And doing this activity over and over, this soon becomes second nature and instinctive. One of the exercises is called the three bullet drill, and you can use three empty shotgun shells or three cups or any items, place them on a ledge 12 to 16 inches apart. Take your unloaded shotgun, double check that it's unloaded. While keeping focus on that center target, slowly mount your firearm to the target on the right. Now lower your shotgun, keep focus on that center target and slowly raise your shotgun to point at the target on the left. The whole purpose of this exercise is to not look at your shotgun barrel as it raises up. You're still looking at your center target, but this is training your brain to accept the shotgun is coming into your field of view. You're improving your muscle memory, you're improving your shotgun mount, and you're improving your focus. However you're gonna be hunting or shooting in the field, practice that before you actually get to the field. Let's use this rock. Double check that your firearm is unloaded. Practice standing up, and as you're standing up, mount your firearm as if you were to take a shot. And sit back down, and then we're gonna do it again. You should mount your firearm as you are standing. It should be one fluid motion. And as you stand up, rotate your body as if you were seeing your target in different locations. Practice this exercise however you're going to be hunting or shooting. So if you're gonna be laying down, you wanna practice laying down. And with an improved gun mount and focus, the chances of hitting your target are much greater. There's always room for improvement. By practicing the flashlight drill, three bullet drill, and different mounting positions, your shotgunning will be on point. There are no shortcuts. With patience, practice, and perseverance, you will increase your shotgun proficiency. They're mostly up in here. They're just clouds of them. They're just clouds of them. This is my business and where I live in uh, South Travis County. We've never seen this before, half a dozen at a time maybe. Now, I don't know, they're hundreds, thousands. They look like leaves, brown leaves, so you don't really even notice the numbers of them. It's one of their stopover points on the way to Mexico. It's a Monarch Motel. These same monarchs right here today that we're seeing, those that survive through the winter will come back through Texas next uh, March and April. In the spring, these will get as far north as Kansas. Um, so a, a distance of some 3,000 miles. Phenomenal. That's a pretty amazing sight. Just lucky that it's 10 feet from my house. Really, really magical.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.